Welcome to GovCast, keeping up with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm Alexander Boloba, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is staff writer researcher Anastasia Opus. Hi, Anastasia. Hey, Alex. So you recently had a chance to talk with Vice Admiral Jeffrey Trussler, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare at the Navy. How'd it go? It went great. Admiral Trussler is retiring as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare. He's been in that position since 2020. And we got the chance to talk about his nearly 40-year career in the Navy, his current role, what he thinks about Jet C2, about the topic that he's really passionate about, which is the importance of radio frequency spectrum, and what he's planning on doing next. Awesome. So you mentioned radio frequency, and the first thing that I think of is just AM, FM, crackly and staticky. Maybe you moved on to uh, XM radio, but obviously we're not talking about what you're hearing in the car every day. This is something different, right? Kind of. So he has talked a lot about sharing radio frequency spectrum with industry. And as we know, frequency spectrum is limited. And as he puts it, it's a great problem to have because industry is working to provide better and faster connection to communities around the country. But the DOD is actually probably the biggest frequency spectrum user. It's crucial to their communications. And obviously, it's getting more and more crowded, especially with things like 5G and the next G. and Now, the issue is to find that middle ground when it comes to sharing that frequency. We need to find the middle ground with the industry. We need to strike the balance between pursuing national security priorities and the country's economic advantage. Yeah, that's a really fascinating thing to be considering that frequencies are a limited resource. I know that's not something I've ever really spent a lot of time thinking about, but it's true. There's only so many things that can go through the air and how much of that needs to be set aside for military versus commercial use. I can understand where that passion comes from because I don't think it's being talked about that much. Yeah, um, all the resources are limited and we have to really think about our priorities and just weighing everything when it comes to national security and when it comes to our economic prosperity. Yeah. Well, I know that we're going to hear a lot more about this during the interview. Uh, But one thing I'd like to bring up in advance is the fact that this is also serving as an exit interview. And during the interview, he goes over his military career and walks us through everything that led him to this point. There's a whole travel log uh, that I'm really excited for our listeners to hear. But with an exit interview, it's not just about the past, but looking ahead to the future. Uh, So what did Vice Admiral Trussler talk about in terms of the future of warfare and just what he wants us to keep an eye out for. So something that came up during our conversation is his concerns about defending our critical infrastructure. And I've written about defending our critical infrastructure. We usually pay a lot of attention to our IT. We usually pay attention to our weapon systems, but we don't talk a lot about critical infrastructure. And it was interesting to hear him talk about it. And he said he really worries less about cyber attacks on weapon systems and ships, but rather attacks on our critical infrastructure sectors, like financial services, like our water treatment plants, or, you know, just getting gas at the gas station, things like that. So it's really interesting to hear his perspective on where we're heading in terms of our future warfare. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine what it would be like waking up one morning and, you know, if the internet wasn't working, where would we be from there? And I imagine it is 
I think he talks about in the interview, the concern isn't taking over something, but just stopping something from working, denial of service, and just to have some sort of, I don't know, internet outage or electricity outage. It makes you think about how vulnerable we are and kind of how precarious things can be. So a lot to think about in advance and don't want to set up this as being doom and gloom because really Vice Admiral Tressler is such a delight to hear speaking and has a lot to share. So without further ado, let's take a listen to your conversation. Admiral, thank you so much for joining me today. You are retiring as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare. I'm sure you've been reflecting on your nearly 40-year career. Could you go back to the beginning, talk about your career trajectory, your time in the Navy, your current role, and how your career prepared you for your role that you're currently in? Wow. How long did you say we have? Uh, that could, you know, I could, I could tell stories and talk about that for a really long time. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, I, I stumbled into the Navy uh, back when I was uh, a junior at Oklahoma State University. Uh, and I, I joined the Navy through the Nuclear Propulsion Officer Candidate Program. And uh, so that's, that's a program that looks for, uh, you know, STEM students at uh, good engineering uh, colleges and uh, brings them in to, uh, to, for the Nuclear Power Program. And so uh, my, I enlisted in, uh, in uh, April of 1984. My job was to finish college and maintain a good GPA uh, before going off to officer candidate school in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. In fact, uh, one of my uh, uh, mates there at Newport, Rhode Island that we were commissioned together was Admiral Caudill, our uh, current fleet forces commander. We're the only two left from that uh, from that summer in Newport back in 1985. But uh, so I, I really didn't know what I was getting into. I was great. I'm signing up. I'm going to learn how to operate nuclear power plants for the Navy. I really didn't understand that I was going to learn uh, to, uh, you know, drive submarines, shoot torpedoes, shoot missiles, uh, and things like that. And then, uh, you know, I'm from, uh, I'm, I'm just a, just a kid, thick kid from uh, Miami, Oklahoma, Ottawa County. I'd never flown on a plane or even seen the ocean until the Navy did that for me, you know, when I, when I signed up. And uh, so, uh, uh, after uh, 18 months, two years of training, uh, finally off to my first command, uh, which was the USS Honolulu, a fast attack submarine out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It was the newest submarine in the fleet. That was awesome. But when I got to Hawaii, I figured out that the ship was gone and it was on a Western Pacific deployment. So uh, I uh, cooled my heels there for a couple of weeks and then I got on a plane, flew to Manila, and uh, joined the ship in the Philippines in Subic Bay. So uh, from uh, from there to Singapore, to Yakuska, Hong Kong, uh, multiple port visits and great operations in the Pacific, you know, like, wow. I mean, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but what a great experience I had. I joined a great ship uh, and a great uh, crew and a great team uh, that got me off to a really good start. They uh, trained me right. Uh, turned me into the submariner I was, uh, get, you know, getting qualified there. My skipper, Turbo Tom Flanagan, uh, at the time, uh, and then uh, the second half of the tour there with Fighting Joe Enright. You know, I've got a nickname for everybody uh, that I've served with. Uh, but that that was that was my start, and uh, and I'm and I'm living in you know I'm living in Hawaii for three years, so I, I got a shore duty. Uh, I wanted to stay right there in Hawaii, so I worked at the uh, command center there for the Submarine Force Pacific Fleet. And so all of a sudden, right out of the gate, this kid from Oklahoma had hadn't seen much other than, uh, you know, maybe six flags in Texas uh, before I, you know, before I uh, joined the Navy. Uh, now I'm, uh, you know, I've been uh, all over Asia. I've lived in Hawaii for five years. And, uh, you know, that's how I that's how I got my start. So a classic submarine career. You know, I got to a department head tour. I went to an SSBN, a ballistic missile submarine uh, for a department head tour where I was the engineer. Back to Hawaii for two more tours. One of them was the executive officer of uh, USS Columbus. Back on my back on uh, as an engineer, department head tour. Uh, I learned a lot from my skipper George the Animal Durand. Uh, you know, he he turned me into the war fighter I am, uh, quite frankly, because that, that's my, that was my stage of learning at the time. And then uh, when I got to Columbus to be the executive officer for uh, Storm and Norm Moore. He, he taught me how to be a CEO. And so that, that's kind of how I look at my career, careers, these influential uh, people uh, and the opportunities they had. 
And then the next step is to get to go to my own command, be the captain uh, of a submarine, USS Maryland. But I didn't, uh, I actually didn't get picked. You know, when our, our, our process by picking commanding officers and executive officers, and uh, when the dust cleared and uh, the door opened after the last board, I actually wasn't on the list. I didn't get picked. I was on the bench. I was on the farm team, as we would call it, in this special category. And uh, wow, I, I was qualified to go to command, but I wasn't selected to go to command. So now what? Uh, so I, I went off uh, to another job uh, in Millington, Tennessee, and uh, working hard. And fortunately, I got an opportunity that, that presented itself, and uh, me and a few others slipped in uh, on a uh, an unprecedented, uh, what we call a fourth opportunity and a fourth look. Uh, and uh, we got picked up, and all seven of us that got picked up on that extra look went on and had great command tours, and I got, got to go on to major command tours uh, at the Captain 06 level. So uh, probably the, my fondest time in the Navy then was a command of a USS Maryland, uh, a ballistic missile submarine out of Kings Bay, Georgia. And uh, so I could tell sea stories all day long about my crew, about the ship, and, uh, you know, and if, if when people ask me what uh, about my career, and uh, what I look back on uh, and, and remember most, it's, it's obviously time with Maryland, you know, at sea, you know, for three years so with a crew and the opportunity. I mean, we're talking sailors who are right out of high school uh, to boot camp, some kind of training, and then they're on board the ship. And it's your job to turn, make them part of your team and to make that team function. And uh, my time on Maryland, my motto was always, I want the best all around team, not the best A team. Uh, I didn't want to just uh, gear up and put the right people in the right place for the right situation. Uh, I said, that's interesting. You, sometimes you may want to do that. Now I want to be able to have the best all around team. If somebody goes down, gets sick, gets hurt, uh, that somebody else can step right in behind them, that we can move people in and around. And so uh, that was kind of my focus uh, and command philosophy was the best all around team. We have to be flexible. We have to be uh, resilient, but just uh, an extraordinary time back in 2003 to 2006. And then uh, the opportunity at the next command level was at uh, Task Force 69 in Naples, Italy. So I got to be the first commander of Task Force 69. So that commanded the undersea forces and uh, ASW, anti submarine warfare operations, uh, basically for the Navy in Europe and Africa. So from the Arctic. Uh, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, from the Indian Ocean uh, to the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Baltic. Uh, just a fabulous job working with great people out there. Uh, my bosses, uh, uh, Admiral Winnefeld, Admiral Clinton, uh, and uh, Admiral Harris, you know, just fast, six fleet commanders, fabulous to work for. And I got to work with our future CNO, uh, Admiral John Richardson. Uh, when he was the uh, submarine group eight and the deputy six fleet commander out there and Vice Admiral Joe Leidig. Uh, so I just had, I've always had great examples and great leaders to look up to and uh, and learn from. But that tour in uh, Italy for two years uh, was just fabulous. The opportunity to work with our allies, uh, other navies, uh, living in Europe. And when you live in Europe, you get to go explore parts of Europe that you wouldn't normally think of. Uh, so if you're going to try, if you're going to sit down and plan a trip to Europe right now, you would go to some big capital city like London or Paris or Rome and probably, yeah, or maybe, maybe Tuscany, you know, something like that. But once you're living over there, you realize there are so many other things to see and opportunities that are easy to just go do, uh, you know, on a weekend or take a few days off. So uh, fabulous. Uh, back here to the joint staff and which started a, a long, long period of time for me in Washington, D.C. So uh, a great job working for General Milley when he was just a one star uh, general down on the joint staff. We were working hard during the uh, Arab Spring, uh, the uh, when and when all these uh, issues in Syria that we're still dealing with were starting up uh, just a just a uh, withdrawal, the declaration of withdrawal. Uh, from Iraq and the ongoing, uh, you know, potential surge, you know, in Afghanistan. So all, all of these operations that for a simple, simple submarine are eyes wide open to the larger military context. So just a, a transformative tour for me and understanding the larger, you know, what the DOD and the military uh, does. And uh, ever since then, I've been supporting, you know, what I call national security operations kind of back and forth between the intelligence community and uh, the DOD. And I've had several jobs that have just, I've been a, 
uh, and, and pivot points between those jobs, linking up capabilities and opportunities uh, and together. And so that eventually landed me the opportunity I have here as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare and Director of Naval Intelligence. So anyway, that's uh, 39 years and uh, just a few minutes there. Incredible. And could you talk a little bit about your position right now and your responsibilities? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. So I took over June of uh, 2020 from uh, a fine officer, uh, Matt Kohler, Vice Admiral Matt Kohler. And uh, so back in 2009, uh, the Navy uh, created the Information Warfare Community. They called it the Information Dominance Community at the time, but uh, since changed name to the Information Warfare Community. And they took uh, some disparate uh, but uh, highly impactful communities such as intelligence, cryptologic warfare, uh, oceanographic and meteor meteorology, uh, information professionals, IT operators, uh, both officer and enlisted rates, and said, we need, we're going to combine you into a community. They still maintain their identities, their specializations, their, their designators. But uh, they said, we're going to create the information warfare community so that we uh, provide consistent, common sort of training paths and standards. And in recognition of what warfare is going to look like in the 21st century, we want to make sure those these complementary, informative fields are cohesive and work together to provide commanders the, the best decision advantage they have possible to support our combat and, you know, and frankly, our kinetic operations. So uh, 2009. And so at the echelon one level here for uh, at, the, at the Navy, uh, they, uh, they combined a couple of jobs and they created the deputy chief of naval operations for information warfare. So I support our chief uh, on a daily basis in all those arenas. So uh, in, in information technology uh, for the Navy, uh, cyber security. Uh, space operations, cryptologic warfare uh, operations, intelligence, intelligence operations. Uh, you know, intelligence is a big uh, part of my uh, portfolio. And and when I talk about that, what do we do here as as a deputy chief? Uh, what do we do here at Echelon One on the CNO staff? Uh, we do policy. Uh, we provide requirements and we provide resources that we issue out to our uh, systems command, to our uh, to our program executive office and our program managers, you know, that will acquire uh, uh, and maintain and sustain capabilities we need uh, for the fleet. So uh, that's how what, you know, a deputy chief, you know, does up here. So I do that for the information warfare community and I support our uh, our type commander. Down there, that's Vice Admiral Kelly Oshbach. She's in charge of uh, the organization of our forces and uh, how they are trained and the day-to-day -day management of the, the information warfare community. And uh, and then directly uh, Vice Admiral Clapperton, our uh, commander of our 10th Fleet, our Fleet Cyber Commander. He's uh, dual-hatted as uh, Echelon 2 Command directly under the C CNO. And he is a component commander supporting both Cybercom and uh, Spacecom, Spacecom, two combatant commanders. So he's got a big job. My job is to support and resource them and their capabilities. And, you know, just a quick follow up question. When you were talking about the trajectory of your career and working with allies and now in your current position, I'm curious to know from your perspective, what was information sharing like back then and what it's like now and how it's evolved and what are some of the challenges when it comes to um, sharing intelligence and working with allies? No, no, good question. A good question. Yeah. So uh, as, uh, uh, as the other hat I wear, director of naval intelligence, uh, I, I probably uh, deal more with allies than any of my counterparts because we have a myriad of intelligence sharing agreements with uh, other navies and uh, other countries managed through the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, and or uh, potentially the Director of National Intelligence. So a lot of work there. But when I go back and look at just uh, my time in, in, say, Italy, and if you're going to manage you know, undersea operations. So, so there, there are just basics of, hmm, well, there's a lot of countries in Europe that have submarines and a couple that have nuclear submarines. And when you're uh, driving around under, undersea, you, you can't see each other. We, we operate uh, 
uh, with uh, these schemes to prevent mutual interference. So air traffic control under sea. So if just the United States, we have our own scheme of how we operate in our waters. Well, what are our waters globally? Well, they're what they look like, but they're not ours exclusively. Other nations can be there on the surface of the sea and in the air. That's the global commons. And we have uh, rules of the road that govern how we and agreements between nations, large international agreements between nations. under the sea. It's a little different. So you have to work very closely with your allies on how you manage that. So that's it. That was a day to day job working with the other countries, mainly in, in a NATO context. Sometimes we have to do some bilateral, trilateral agreements just to not hit each other under sea as submarines. And then uh, and then if we uh, as a, you know, as a common nation, uh, a common group of nations, you know, we had a pretty big adversary over there. And, uh, you know, it's not a secret. It was Russia. Uh, and uh, so uh, if we are concerned about their undersea operations, which that was my job, my focus, undersea operations uh, and uh, the monitoring of their operations. And are they uh, creating a security risk to us by where they deploy and where they position their missiles and assets? Uh, we have to work as allies together uh, to monitor them. And sometimes uh, you're, uh, it's about the best athlete to provide to monitor a, a quiet, you know, Russian submarine, or potentially uh, the available assets or capacity. And that's uh, so that was a constant work to to have the allies working on the same page and as a as a refined team. So we we practice uh, that a lot. We do the same thing today. It's just it's just better because they have built upon some of the work we were doing back then. And that was largely in an operational context. But the intelligence sharing that we dealt with still worked. Now, in this job, I, I mentioned that uh, we have intelligence sharing agreements. We're constantly working to enhance and Im improve those. Uh, in the uh, my information warfare hat writ large, in fact, I just uh, had some meetings, you know, recently uh, with some of our allies uh, to uh, how do we better communicate? How do we better exchange information that gets to that gets to these uh, topics you may hear about, you know, like our project overmatch or JAD C2 and so forth. Things we the United States want to do and how we solve the problem of our service, different services and capabilities working together with our with our sensors, our platforms and our weapon systems, then. Uh, doing that amongst ourselves is a challenge, a little bit of a challenge, nothing we're not working through actively right now, but then also our allies. If we're, if we say we're going to fight tonight with our allies, well, then we have to be able to communicate and exchange information and data. So those agreements uh, are important. That day-to-day -day collaboration to understand what works, where we can connect and don't is, uh, is, a, is a regular part of my job. Yeah, and in terms of the challenges, you know, from the um, security perspective, from the differences in policy perspective, how do you see working through that and exchanging information in a secure manner with your allies? Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it, that's the daily job. Yeah, that's the yeah. daily job because it's not it's not U.S. Navy. Uh, wants to work with, uh, you know, some European Navy or some, uh, you know, Asian partner Navy. It's uh, it, all those. It, there's there's uh, there's very rare the authorities or abilities we have to establish agreements and sharing uh, with other nations that isn't isn't managed or regulated by an overarching agreement at the DOD or the government level. So that's that's the work that we do up here, you know, on the Navy staff. Uh, you know, in partnership uh, with the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense. So that is the day that that is the grind. That's the daily work we do. It's not it's not the glamorous work of sailing the seas with our allies, uh, but it is the uh, it is the unglamorous behind the scenes work that we got to do so that when our allies are sailing with us uh, in harm's way, we can operate effectively together. Uh, and we can go to a fight tonight because we have uh, built in the systems, the procedures, the training and the people uh, that can effectively uh, plug in, plug out and uh, uh, fire if needed uh, or defend if needed. And, you know, going back to you mentioned Jet C2, I'm curious. I baited you on that one. <laughs> Ask me. 
<laughs> but we all know it's a big focus. So I want to know your thoughts. I want to know your perspective in terms of how can IT unify the different branches and components for a more secure data savvy joint force and, you know, where we can deliver better results. Right, right. Hey, hey, a complex uh, topic when you say JADC2, because, yeah. uh, and uh, and I, I am, I have never been misquoted, but the context has always been difficult. And uh, so now that I've, I've had three years of practice to try to explain it, because it is a regular question at every big conference or industry event, uh, even on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, it is a question. What is it? What are you doing? How much are you spending on it? What do you need? Industry is eager to help us. We know that. And so I think, you know, if, if, if there was one light criticism, it's because we gave it a name and we spoke it out loud and then therefore it became a thing. And uh, it, in my mind, it's really it's really a process that we're working through. So I I. I describe it, uh, I use the Navy as an example, but it applies to the other services. The Navy is an extraordinarily platform-centric service. We are the most platform-centric service by far. The ships, submarines, and aircraft. And we have weapon systems that we can use from platforms, those, those platforms that deliver, the, deliver uh, kinetic capabilities. And in general, weapon systems were developed to take advantage of organic sensors that they have, okay? Sonars, radars, things like that. Now, uh, it's been very easy in the uh, 21st century in the age of uh, uh, precision guided munitions to develop weapons that can far exceed our organic sensors on platforms. Therefore, they can take targeting from other sources, from other aircraft, from other ships, or even satellites. So how do we, make sure that a ship with a certain weapon system and missile type, well, that missile can go a lot farther it can hit, but I have to get that information, whether it's the sensor and then I can determine my own targeting solution, or I get a targeting solution handed to me. How do we pass that data? So we've built some incredible capability. Sometimes we have built all these capability, these remote sensors or, or sensors between platforms or the ability to pass firing solutions. We've built them not specifically to exchange data. And now that we have uh, upgraded the weapon system quite a bit, we've realized, wow, ooh, this doesn't it cleanly exchange data just like I want it. Or the maybe the Navy and the Air Force's system can't talk to each other uh, as cleanly as would like. Or that the Army or the Marine Corps, if they're stationed, could provide a targeting solution or could provide fires from something seen by overhead. How do we how do we make sure that seamlessly connects together? So between inside each service, we're all working through some of those uh, obstacles and challenges. And, and they're and they're just obstacles to knock down. They're not overcomable. We just got to step through them. And then we have to make sure that what we're doing in the Navy will work with the Army, the Air Force and the Marine Corps. And we're doing that. So when you hear Project Overmatch or Project Convergence or the Air Force's, uh, you know, uh, ABMS, lots of things, people uh, sometimes try to play these off as well. Which one are you going with? What is it's it's competition? They're 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 not moving forward because they're competing. That is absolutely false. All of these efforts are experimenting, developing, and we are knocking down barriers every day. And if you look back over the three years I've been watching this, ooh, we are able to do some things now. And we're not going to advertise what that is or what those capabilities are. We're just not going to talk about it publicly. In my mind, we have made some great strides. The focus and effort you hear a lot recently, though, because I what I gave you was a how we exchange information and data. OK, how are radios talking to each other? I'll just say it as simply as that. OK, and people will say that's not the problem. Well, that's going to well, I guarantee you that's a problem when we go to a fight against a, a, a highly capable adversary that we may have to in the Western Pacific. The electromagnetic spectrum is going to be filled with energy trying to prevent us from talking to each other. So those, so. Even in a benign environment, sometimes where it may be tough to exchange information, we're going to go into a pretty tough environment. So the ability to get to a point where we can trade data 
is important. What you hear a lot of focus lately, and at the OSD level, the creation of the uh, Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office, and, and maybe them ha having the, uh, the big role or representative for uh, GIC2 for, at the OSD level, that goes to another facet of it. We have gads of information because of the sensor systems we have inherent in our platforms and in our overhead architecture. Therefore, how is all that data going to be managed and how do we securely move it around? And so it's not a one versus the other. It's not a focus here versus a focus there. It is just there are several really big vectors for us to develop. And this isn't something that we, the DOD, are just going to put out and say, well, here's what we want. Because if we started from a clean sheet of paper right now, we could design a really interesting and good, uh, you know, battle stars, you know, system of connectivity. Uh, we don't have that luxury. We have a Navy with 300 ships and submarines and several thousand aircrafts. We have an Air Force with several thousand aircraft. We have uh, Army and Marine Corps with uh, also multiple weapon systems and aircraft. And uh, so, wait a minute, you know, we, we, we're, that is the DOD as it exists right now. We can't just write that off and start from scratch. So as we think about every new technology, every new weapon system, every new sensor, uh, we're, how will it plug into a larger architecture that we are developing, building, taking advantage of all the great work by the Space Force, National Reconnaissance Office, uh, both DOD and intelligence community to take advantage of those big sensors? How making sure that we build to support and connect, but we have to be backward compatible to all the legacy of the great systems that we have now. It is uh, it is uh, complicated, I'll say, but I won't say that I won't say that it's really that complex. We just have to identify the mission threads we want, the weapon systems we want, the sensors. And we just start knocking those down and making them compatible. And usually it's about choices of how we make them compatible. A box here or a box there, or do we backfit this here? So it is a myriad of options that we're working through and then making sure that we start creating data streams and data lakes that are compatible and usable uh, by everybody and not exclusive to systems. That is ongoing work. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to result in some large request for proposal out there that I know industry may be clamming for. There may be quite a few of them. We're working through that. I think we've made tremendous progress. And also something you mentioned, and I really wanted to ask you about sharing radio frequency spectrum with industry. And you have expressed concerns previously, all because of the potential to disrupt DoD users and compromise the security. So could you discuss the importance of radio frequency spectrum to maintaining the Navy's information and intelligence dominance? Yeah, great. I have been rather passionate on that subject. I don't think I've sat a panel yet where asked, where asked about radio frequency spectrum or not. I haven't jumped in with an answer about the radio frequency spectrum. I drove one moderator nuts because she kept asking me questions about space and I kept talking about radio frequency spectrum, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this is all about physics. This is all about physics. And it just turns out that there's uh, some sweet spot in the spectrum. Uh, you know, we'll call it, we'll call the mid band of the spectrum. I won't get into specific details where uh, energy at certain frequencies can travel distances that are of relevance and then can be uh, useful at the fidelity we want. And it just so happens, you know, for, and I'm talking about, frankly, radars. Okay. Now, and, and, and some communications. Now, uh, it also so happens that in the grand scheme of 5G that you hear about, and the ability to provide more, better, and faster connections for our devices, and our capabilities out there, that's a pretty good sweet spot for that spectrum too. So it's uh, what a great first world superpower problem to have because we have industry clamoring to bring us better quality of life 
better solutions every day for our daily personal lives, to our industries, uh, to keep our technological edge in the United States. This is a superpower problem. So although I get animated and some folks here in the Pentagon may get a little animated about it, it's just a great problem to have. My concern and my worry is just that uh, before, if we sell off parts of the spectrum, that it is a absolute decision that we understand potential trade-offs or risks or that we have identified how it will be mitigated. For the Navy, for example, it's just, hey, uh, you know, our ability to uh, to uh, train like we fight and then potentially fight like we train because we are uh, daily testing training on the full spectrum of our incredible combat system radars and things like that. If we're limited a bit because we're not allowed to interfere with certain frequencies, we we start maybe either losing confidence in or not having confidence in or regular natural natural uh, in, in a ballistic missile defense scenario of how we're going to operate our radars because we've done something falsely or that we've pushed ourselves so far offshore uh, that we're we're that we're wasting training time just getting out to a safe area outside the national airspace, you know, or something like that. So that that's a challenge. Uh, I mean, the ballistic missile defense of North America is based on radars that use frequencies that are you know are being discussed about selling. So there there's some concerns there. It's not that's not specific to Navy. That's all services. Uh, all uh, I think all services have major weapons systems that we operate and train on. In North America, we do R and D at our training ranges because we are constantly upgrading, testing new, uh, and uh, we've got decades and billions of dollars into some of the weapon systems and radars that support them. Over the years, we have weapon systems uh, that that are tested and run and operate in these frequencies. So we're very concerned. Uh, one about selling off pieces of spectrum that right now are allocated to the DoD such that, well, we can't, we now are limited from using them or limited to areas that are not relevant or that somehow impact our large training ranges or our offshore training ranges. So that that is an impact. Or if, or if we get to an agreement on sharing the spectrum, I, I'm just concerned because I don't know that we have demonstrated sharing of the spectrum effectively yet. I know that there have there's some agreements in place. I don't know how much runtime we have to show that the methodologies for how sharing works actually work yet. So that's my big concern. And my big push that I push with DOD, anybody that'll listen to me on Capitol Hill or anywhere else, that's just, hey, make sure it's deliberate. Make sure that everybody is at the table and that everybody nods that they understand because I, I worry that there's, uh, uh, you know, a, a big group of people that are really pushing to give industry opportunity and enhance our the United States overall technological advantage and commercial opportunities and versus the DOD. And I'm sure that the DOD, we are considered uh, outdated, slow, and uh, that we're really not using that much. And I, I get it. But there's uh, there's various levels of classification of things we use, no use that we publicly aren't going to talk about. So it's about getting everybody at the table. So I, I am big and passionate on that. I want eyes wide open. And uh, Mr. John Sherman, our DOD CIO, uh, leads that effort for the department, doing a fabulous job. Him and uh, Fred Moorfield, who, who leads that for him. And and I'm just I'm constantly poking, pushing. I'm 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 being the loud. Send send me in and put the helmet on, and I'll go hit the brick wall for you. And then you you come in and give the good explanation because I, we're passionate about that in the investments we have in the Navy uh, from those systems we own. Man, flip the switch on this guy. He'll talk forever. <laughs> and I was going to say, what would be the message that you want to leave here? Uh, but you just phrased it perfectly. And, you know, just a couple of last questions. And they are about your career. And, you know, as you're preparing to exit the role, looking back at your current role, what are some of the biggest achievements and uh, what are some of the biggest takeaways, lessons learned over the past couple of years? Yeah, I think that uh, what I've uh, taken away most uh, from this role in, in looking at how we uh, think about the Navy, because as I said, up here working for the CNO, you know, our job at the Echelon One role of the Navy staff is to, uh, you know, resource fund and provide for uh, the fleet and Navy we have now. And it's to develop 
the Navy of the future. And, uh, and that's the same way with every service. And uh, we have classic roles that each of these services perform. So the Navy, obviously, we operate in the maritime with ship, submarine, and aircraft. It is our big role, very clearly laid out, uh, you know, for us, you know, in, in Title Ten and in the Constitution, quite frankly. So uh, what I worry about and a lesson learned is that in this day and age, there's there's probably no more sneak attack with with missile strikes or bombs or, uh, you know, troops coming around a hill that you didn't see overnight uh, or fleets fleets sailing up close and firing on you uh, the day that th those days are over i think that um you know if we if if we go to a conflict with a big adversary uh it's going to start in the cyber arena and the one day you know we're not going to see maybe a, we may or may not see some large movement of ships troops don't know you know we don't know but I'm afraid one day we're going to wake up and things just don't work right. Whether DOD things, whether you're whether you're something at home or some cities, water doesn't work and we don't know why. Uh, this is the 21st century. We are well into the third decade of the 21st century. Denial of services, not just take not just taking them over. I mean, some people talk about, you know, taking things over or taking weapons systems over or something like that, 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 that very, very, very difficult to do, but just disruption of the ability to use something. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I, I less, I, frankly, I worry less about, you know, you know, cyber attacks on ships and weapon systems. Although I know the adversaries, you know, working on that, just they're like, we're working on it. Uh, we all, well, that's the cyber age, but, uh, the soft targets that may, change the will of the people, uh, the will of our government uh, because of uh, the impact to our people, you know, that's where, that's where, you know, um, the big we, the people, the we, the nation will be involved or not. Nobody's going to touch us kinetically in general. You know, we're, we're pretty safe. And, uh, you know, it's September 11, 2001, pretty important reminder of it's not always, it's not, oh, we're not completely invulnerable. But in general, a large attack that's going to impact thousands or large chunks of the country, it's not going to happen kinetically with some attack. But in the cyber world, there's a whole lot of pricks that could be done, a whole lot of things that could uh, make us have a bad day if we can't pump gas or get money out of ATMs or things are shut down that cause a bit of a concern or a panic. And uh, those, you know, from day to day, the cyber world, so I, you know, cyber as a military, you know, operation and a function, interesting, I love it. But I think day to day, I'm worried that most Americans don't really understand how vulnerable they personally are or their systems are, uh, because we live in an age where everything is done uh, through microprocessors and uh, uh, IP addresses. Therefore, that's an extraordinary attack vector uh, that the price of entry for even the simplest of nations or the simplest of criminals with just a bit of sophistication and training can do from their own basement or some high powered, uh, you know, state sponsored, you know, uh, you know, a facility. And so the lesson learned I take is uh, it's not going to go away. And although we focus on our large classic weapon systems and platforms, that cybersecurity, that piece has got to be built in. When we look at our infrastructure on our bases, we have to look very closely at what our vulnerabilities are that are going to support, uh, you know, support our uh, our troops and our ships that are going uh, to sea. On the other hand, I will uh, say the big, you know, the lesson that has been reinforced in this job that no matter what the technological advantage we have, or the technologies we develop and want and work on, it always or the great ship submarines and aircraft we have, and we have some great ones that the most important thing is the people. They are still hunks of metal. We are not in any way, shape, or form going to be to some autonomous uh, military. We are a thinking, smart Navy. Uh, probably the biggest advantage we have uh, over all of our adversaries is the way we train our people to think. We give our uh, commanders mission command orders what we want them to accomplish, not how to accomplish. And we train our people to solve problems. We constantly are training what happens if this doesn't work. We are at sea. We can't just pull in to get it fixed. 
How do we continue to operate and deliver lethal effects? Our people are what makes that happen day in, day out, whether that's people here working at the Pentagon, whether that's people on the front line uh, out in our fleet. The most important uh, aspect uh, the, uh, of what we do as leaders and managers in the Navy is taking care of our people. Uh, just That's just reinforced uh, here for me uh, in this job. Yeah, and just to clarify what you were referring to as one of your main concerns is, I'm assuming it's critical infrastructure. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. Uh, oh, absolutely. Gr yes, critical infrastructure. If I said those words, the whole explanation could have been about 10 minutes shorter. No, absolutely. And you asked about you asked about accomplishments. And so uh, in our in our ability to understand our cyber vulnerability and harden ourselves up in accomplishments, uh, uh, there, there's a there's a lot of rules and processes. Hey, when the right thing doesn't happen, naturally rules are created. And uh, and as a, and in the government, we 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 provide lots of rules and guidelines and ideas and things like that. So the process to get something certified to operate, uh, you know, is enormous. And so one thing we've done in the Navy, we have chopped through a lot of things to get for our uh, for our program managers uh, and our uh, PEOs to to uh, chop through and get to uh, uh, an authority to operate process, you know, much quicker. We've 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 we changed some policy. Uh, we've removed rules that are non value, uh, non value added there. We uh, we have also upgraded and we're still working through this, but uh, we, we got some you know big documents signed just recently. We've been working for about two and a half years to get our communications stations, our NICTAMs, NCTSs, our maritime operations are upgraded to what we call fleet units. So now we're going to treat them like ships. They're just as important as ships. In fact, our ships uh, you know, will not operate uh, cleanly or smoothly without those uh, critical stations around the world. And so uh, we've got them upgraded. They have the same classification now as a Navy ship. And uh, therefore, we're going to treat them with program offices, with funding, with life cycle management plans uh, and uh, and readiness standards that we treat our ships. And so that's that's been a bit of a slog and a work. And uh, our team, in fact, our team just cut a cake last week uh, celebrating us getting over the uh, over the hump on that. And then if I if I look back over my career, I would say, uh, you know, back on uh, it's all the all the people. Uh, that uh, have influenced me and that I've had the opportunity to influence. And in my command on Maryland, I had eight officers go on uh, that worked for me, from my executive officers to my junior officers uh, in the department. It's uh, eight officers from that uh, ship that gone on to uh, commands of their own. And among the enlisted ranks, uh, multiple command master chiefs and chiefs of the boats of submarines and engineering department master chiefs couldn't be prouder of those folks. And maybe, and I guarantee you, that's exactly why I was successful because so many good people around me and they, and they proved it out by how they continued on uh, in their career. So I've just been very lucky over this 39 years uh, to just have so many opportunities in the Navy. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it a little bit. I could go for another hour, but I know we're, we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And as we're wrapping up, what's next for you? Uh, I'm going to go on a cruise. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Where are you going to uh, go? Uh, we'll we'll see. I don't want I don't want people follow me around out there. I want to <laughs> I want a little I want a little relaxed time. Now, uh, probably a couple of cruises. Uh, I tell you what, uh, what I will do, and I can't believe I haven't already. If you didn't know, if you didn't know this about me, I'm now a walking public service announcement but for the importance of uh, CPR uh, training and uh, uh, automatic external defibrillators (AEDs). And I had an event uh, earlier this year when I were into, when I went into cardiac arrest and collapsed at a fitness class. And uh, fortunately, uh, some bystanders, a lot of medical training, um, uh, conducted CPR, used the AED properly on me, uh, the defibrillator, and jilted me. And uh, I arrived in the emergency room awake and talking after flatlining. And uh, uh, I did not appreciate uh, that a 10% survival rate in that situation, that, that it was so low. And uh, so uh, I a bit, I'm a bit of a self, uh, self-appointed ambassador for uh, organizations and people to uh, have that CPR training, to know where in their building AEDs are. Do you know where nearest AED are in your building? I can point to two of them right now that I could snatch in about 60 seconds if needed. But uh, chances of survival increase uh, three times with the use of CPR and an AED. And so uh, a little, when you ask what I'm going to do afterwards, so part of what I'm doing, I'm going to, I am going to become an instructor uh, of, and I will estimate that probably is not a full time, but I want to offer, I will be able to offer my services to help uh, organizations or people uh, to train on or get certified, you know, for CPR and AED use, because uh, that is now obviously a, a passionate issue of mine. 
Admiral, thank you so, so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me today. Of course. GovCast, along with HealthCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. 